Hi, in this slide uh, we're going to talk about the general pattern uh, if you had a, a XY axis of how we progress in a in a skill development area over time. Get my highlighter going here. So if we had um, uh, <laughs> that bad Y axis and an X axis, so this is time going this way, time, and this is skill levels, black belt, 10th degree being weighed up at the top, what happens is we begin, and often beginnings are hard. You know, they're very frustrating. Uh, we just are just, we're just terrible. We're all thumbs. Um, but if we hang in there, at some point, we kind of get uh, sort of a, a quick integration of, 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 of elements, and, and we have a little pop. We get to the next step. And actually, for a while, we're brilliant. And then as we start to think about why well, we're brilliant or we over-exercise over or use our new thing, we, we, we get sort of uh, mechanical about it. If you have a new hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So we backtrack a little bit, but then we're on the next plateau. Now, what the idea of the plateau is it's not bad. In other words, gee, I'm, I'm, I'm just flat here. I'm not making any progress. But actually, it's on the plateau where we're focusing on a certain aspect, and that aspect may have a cluster or a critical mass of sub-elements to it. Uh, sometimes people will call it a chunk. In other words, you have to master a certain chunk of things to be able to do this particular move or this particular uh, task. Um, and we have to mindfully, sort of with our small conscious you know, ability, focus on one element at a time until we've gotten all three, four, five, six elements that are in the chunk, and then we try to just relax and just do it all together, get some sort of integrative rhythm, and at some point we do, and we get a little breakthrough, and we pop up to the next level, and we go, great, and then we pick a, set, a next thing to work on, and so, so it goes. Now, at each, each plateau, when we get to the integration level, they really, we start to, to, to try to go to what, we, what, what I might call unconscious incompetence. In other words, we, don't have, we do it automatically, habitually, without thinking about it. And that's sort of the fourth stage of five stages of, of, of how we learn stuff. And down here are those five stages. The first stage would be, all right, we, we don't know what we don't know. And when somebody says, let me show you how to do something new, we instantly become, uh, go from unconscious, we didn't know we were bad, incompetent, to, oh my gosh, now I am consciously aware that this is a lot more difficult than I ever thought, and I, I just can't do it for beans. But if we hang in there and think about it mechanically, um, we can become consciously, that is mindfully, mechanically, deliberately competent, slowly, haltingly, but at least we're kind of doing it. Then if we say, all right, I want to try to get rhythm and, and, and sort of integration uh, of, of whatever I'm working on, we'll slowly start to become uh, not aware that we are just doing it. So it's sort of a habitual automatic thing. However, there's a big difference between being able to do something without thinking about it and doing it at, a, at an enormously uh, professional level. I mean, there are plenty of, of club uh, golfers and tennis players, for example, who look to us, you know, being a hacker, uh, kind of, wow, those guys are really good. And But when we see them up against somebody who's world class, we realize, my gosh, th there's there's obviously a strong resemblance between the stroke production and so forth. But but the person who's world class is just, they, they do it with such speed and such ease it looks like they're not even trying, and, and the ball goes, you know, so much better in a sense. So to be able to get that kind of speed and precision and compactness, it doesn't even look like they're trying, and the, or they may just be doing a, a little something with their wrist. We don't notice there is there's an imperceptible impulse off their back foot that ripples through their body unimpeded, no extra tension at all. It flows right out through the through the arms and the and the club or the or the, the, the tennis racket they're using, and these are the the, the this is woo wee in a sort of a Zen spiritual and effortless effort. This is where the dancer actually becomes the dance. You don't even sort of notice the dancer mechanically trying to do stuff. Um, so anyway, those are five levels that we could go through on, on 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 any given level. So when you get to a plateau and you think, oh, this is really boring. 
that's because we're not looking at it with the right lenses. And we look at the right lenses, it starts being very fascinating and, and, and interesting and, and, and uh, really provocative. We get very engaged in it to the point where flow, time just zooms by. So when we get to the plateaus, remember that's where the learning is. The key is at that point when we practice, we have to practice patiently and have faith that we can, you know, put all the elements together, get an integration, go through these five levels if we want. The key though is to practice perfectly. Sometimes we think we're practicing the right thing and we need somebody else to say, uh, you know, I'm watching you and you've got some blind spots. You're actually not doing it right. So teachers or masters, if you will, are important to be there. As we go about our practice, uh, don't expect if you're a teacher that everybody in a group is all going to learn in the same the, at the same speed in the same way. Obviously, we have a, a range of natural aptitude and attitude. So how do we let each individual player uh, on the team uh, do their own uh, flow design? So they're, they're practicing in a way where they are they're optimally stressed out and on the hook and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, as we practice, we need feedback from the master to make sure we are practicing perfectly. But we have to, we have to, have, we have to want to be and 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 be able to be a self learner. And we talked in a past module about the importance of being a, a, a self authoring or self learning. A fancier term is autodidactic. So that's a very part, key part of, of moving along the path. You got to want to and and be part of the solution. You can't just expect a teacher to spoon feed you. And then, over time, the if you charted uh, this curve up here, it would really be sort of asymptotic. It would take off and then it would start to level off, still still gradually increasing. But each the plateaus get longer for smaller improvements. But not to be dismayed because the path, the more we know, the more we know we don't know, and the more engaged we become. So the path becomes endless. I remember reading about Dell. And they were slamming together PCs in six hours, and then they decided to switch it from hours to minutes. So they said, all right, we do it in 360 minutes. Can we do it in 359 or 342? So they just they, they changed the metric to sort of get more excited about incremental improvement as far as their, their process engineering for how they basically assembled PCs. So that's the, the mastery path, and let's look at some of the, uh, the alternative versions of the mastery path and, and subsequent clips. Thank you. Where is the pen?